that you don't get into heaven because you like stuff on Facebook. <laughs> you, know, you, you have to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, you have to trust in Him. And I thought, yeah, most people, if you you, you like something, you think, man, I'm I'm with it. Yeah, I'm, I really got it. But you know, it's it's not just knowing about Christ. It's Christ in me that we sang about. Christ in me. It's through His precious blood. It's through a personal relationship with Him. And if you want to know the incredible power of the gospel, you just look at the life of the uh, Apostle Paul. It's incredible what God did in his life. And if you think, uh, well, there's no way that, uh, that I could be changed like that, again, you misunderstand the gospel. The gospel is powerful. The gospel is able to set us free. The gospel is able to work in our lives. So... John read to us in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, and the last couple of days that's been our reading, and I hope that you're reading along and uh, we're getting back into a, another session. Uh, we were just talking, uh, some of us were talking, and you know, God's doing a great work in a lot of the groups in uh, the English speaking congregation, but the Spanish speaking congregation has our first year from. So we're finishing up one year and having the growth groups. And I know of at least five people that were baptized because they were in the growth group. So praise God, five. I mean, you know, there's one joy in heaven over one sinner that repents. And so in the Spanish, there was at least five, five that got baptized because of being in a growth group. So that's what it's all about. And the fact that we're not too excited about it needs to tell us we need to wake up. <laughs> Something's wrong with us, guys. When the world presses in and we're all concerned about everything that's going on in the world and we're not concerned about our relationship with Jesus and other people knowing him. And when Paul, when Saul of Tarsus met Jesus Christ, it totally transformed his life. And he sets himself up as I'm, I'm a pattern. I'm a pattern to you of what God's grace can do in a life. And so when you look at a Christian, don't look at somebody that's uh, worldly and not walking with God, attends church whenever they want to. Don't, don't look at somebody like that. Look at the Apostle Paul. Look at somebody that's really committed to Christ, that's sharing their faith, is excited, filled with the Holy Spirit, has joy in the Lord, hears from God, speaks with God, walks with God. You know, try to... Pick out good people, uh, good people to follow and to look at. But most of all, Jesus Christ. But I'm telling you, you can't go wrong looking at the Apostle Paul either. What a wonderful example he is to us. So with the same zeal, but even more, with which he persecuted the church, he then began to preach the gospel. Now, that's powerful. And... Really, when you look at, uh, he was, he says, I was born out of season, but uh, most people believe that uh, in the desert of Arabia, that Jesus appeared to him and taught him the scriptures because he was a chosen vessel. He was chosen to be an apostle, an apostle to the Gentiles, but also to reach his own people. He, he would have success in both of those areas. But he taught him the word of God personally. He says, I, I was uh, an undo, I was born out of season. These others were with him and they lived with him and they walked with him and they worked with him for three years and they learned a lot of things. But when you look at their life, there was a lot of struggles and a lot of pain. And then they saw the gospel portrayed. They saw Jesus Christ crucified. They saw him raised from the dead. They, they doubted. They had trouble believing it. But when they finally became convinced that Jesus Christ had risen from the dead, it was an amazing thing. You know, at the beginning, they're behind locked doors. They're afraid. They're afraid, hey, they're going to crucify me next. You know, they're going to hang me on a cross next, or they're going to stone me, or they're going to kill me. And uh, the next thing you know, they have this boldness, this incredible boldness, and their life has changed. And, and I, I think that was the big difference, is that by this time, Paul not only was able to spend time with Jesus, but he was also able to be filled with God's Holy Spirit. So we can be filled with the Holy Spirit. 
and with that, there's power in our life. And as we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins so we don't have to live under a burden of guilt. There's so much that we can do, but when you look at his sufferings, it's incredible all that he went through. So let's look at it once again. And uh, he's, you know, kind of defending himself against uh, false apostles. So in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 12, it says, And what I am doing I will continue to do in order to undermine the claim of those who would like to claim that in their boasted mission they work on the same terms as we do. Now normally you never hear Paul talking about himself, talking about his work, talking about what he does. Most of the time he's talking about Jesus. But he knows that there are people who are believing these false apostles, these people who are claiming to be something that they weren't. And uh, so he, 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 had to, he had to speak the truth. And notice what he said, verse uh, 13. Look at that. It says, For such men are false apostles, deceitful workmen, disguising themselves as apostles of Christ, and no wonder, for even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. Hey, that gives us a little bit of an understanding of how Satan works. You know, he doesn't always come offering us evil. Sometimes he comes offering us good. He comes offering us power. He comes offering us success. He comes offering us, you know, maybe an easy life or something like this that like kind of the health, wealth, and prosperity. You know, he'll offer you all of those things, and they'll come and they'll preach that. But the gospel is something different. The gospel is Jesus Christ and him crucified. The gospel, and you see it in Paul's life. I'm not saying that he was sick all the time, but he had a thorn in the flesh. Last week, I think I was, maybe I was talking about that I had picked up a thorn from a cactus. And you know what? That thing's still bothering me. I can't see it. It's so small, I can't even see it. But it still bothers me. It's still painful. And this was like a week ago. You know, you'd think it would fall out or something would happen, and I've tried to clean it. I've scraped it with sandpaper, you know, just trying to get that thing out of there. But it's still bothering me today. It's a thorn. It's a thorn that's bothering me. It's a thorn in my flesh. And it bothers me. And it's, it's, it's at certain times really painful when I pick something. And this is what he says. I had a, a thorn in the flesh. And he says, it was given to me. It was a gift from God. What? To keep me from being puffed up and proud. But it was given to me in the flesh. But notice he says, it was a messenger of Satan. So the messenger boy is Satan. And so in our last message on Wednesday, I think it is, we talked about that of how that Satan works and that how in the, the conversation with Job, how that Job was always trying to, or how Satan was always trying to get God to put his hand against Job, but he never does. It is always God giving Satan permission. He's in your hands, uh, but God himself never put his hand against Job. And so a lot of times people struggle, well, who did this? Was this from God or was this from Satan? Well, Satan, uh, he, it's a messenger of Satan to harass me. So even though the thorn had a purpose and, and, and it, it was actually a messenger of Satan. And so a lot of times when bad things happen in your life, you just need to understand that it's Satan, that Satan hates you. Jesus said the thief comes to steal, to kill, and destroy. So if something's being stolen from you, if something's being killed, if something's being destroyed in your life, you know who the author of that is. It's Satan. It's not God. Jesus said, I've come that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly. He's come to bring good, to bring life. But what does that life mean? It means life in Christ, life knowing him, life serving him. So the enemy attacks us. And notice he said, it was a messenger of Satan to harass me, 
but he says it's a messenger of Satan, but there's a purpose in it, to keep me from becoming conceited. And you'll say, well, why would he be conceited? You know, he's just a lowly pastor. Yeah, just a lowly pastor. You know, everywhere he went, people got saved. Everywhere he went, he was able to plant a church. You know, I know people that have preached in the same community for years and years and years and not even have one single concert, uh, convert. And I think that these are godly people. But Paul, everywhere he went, people would come to Christ. Churches would be planted. No wonder, no wonder he was conceited, how God used him. The manifestations, the things that he saw, the things that he had experienced. And why did he experience those? The more that you're used of God, the more the, the messenger of Satan comes to attack you, and the more you need encouraging words from God's Holy Spirit. You need him to minister to you and to encourage you. And so he says, to keep me from being three times, I pleaded with the Lord about it, that it should leave me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Do we understand that? You know, we think it's being big and powerful according to the world, uh, successful according to the world's standards. But Paul's power resided in the fact that he was a servant of Jesus Christ. I'm not saying that he was perfect. I think even in the scriptures you see sometimes where that he kind of gets in the flesh and uh, you say, yeah, you know, he's given his whole life and a lot is written about him and maybe one or two times. How many times have I gotten in the flesh? Now let me, how many times have you gotten in the flesh? Just last week or a month ago, a year ago, you say, what? <laughs> I don't have to go back a year. Do you even know what it means to get in the flesh? You know, some of you are kind of living in the flesh, and you, you, you don't even realize that it's flesh that's doing the stuff. My grace is sufficient for you for my power. Satan will give you power. There's human power, power that comes from your flesh. My power is made perfect in weakness. We don't really like to talk about that. We don't like to think about that. But whose power do you want? Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. A lot of times we, like Paul, notice three times he prayed about it. Paul didn't like it. He didn't like the thorn in the flesh. He didn't like that it was painful. He didn't like that it was in his flesh. And so three times he prayed about it. And God said no. And then he hushed up about it. And he began to say, I'll boast in my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. That's what we need, folks, the power of Jesus Christ. It's not that you like Christian things on Facebook. It's that you love Jesus Christ and you want His power in your life. He's your life. He's what life is all about. It's Him. Knowing Him. The power of Christ. You know His testimony in Philippians chapter 3. And some of you say, well, you're, you're preaching about Paul, I know all about him. Well, do you really? Are you experiencing anything similar to him in your life as a Christian? But here's his, his testimony. And in verse 2, he says, Look out for the dogs. Look out for the evildoers. Look out for those who mutilate the flesh. You see, they were pushing circumcision. They were saying you had to be circumcised to be right with God. And Paul said that's a Jewish ritual, that's a, a rite, that's something that's even passed away. And he says this, for we are the circumcision who worship by the Spirit of God. And Paul wrote about a circumcision of the heart. You know, circumcision is the, the cutting of the flesh of a male 
And uh, it, it didn't even happen to the female. It was to the male. And it, it was a picture of uh, the cleansing of the flesh and dedicating that child and, and all of this. But Paul says it's just an incredible symbol of the circumcision of our heart. That this heart desires evil things. This heart wants that which is impure and unclean. This heart is deceitful above all things and desperate. And so there's a circumcision of the heart where that you begin to cut that stuff out of your life and you get changed and you have the power of Christ to be able to live a holy life. Do you know the, the only power that this church has in our community is the power of our holy lives? If they see us loving Jesus, if they see us humble, if they see us ministering and serving like Jesus did, they might even crucify us. But at least they'll know that there's something going on, there's something real. That they have to attack us because we're doing good, not because we're evil, not because we're gossipers, not because we're cutting everybody down. No, it's because we are lovers of Jesus Christ. So his testimony... He says, for we are the circumcision who worship by the Spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh. How many of you know that Jesus says that uh, the flesh profits nothing? Nothing, absolutely zero. That's what the flesh can do. But if you're not filled with the Holy Spirit, then you're doing things through the flesh. So it's an absolute zero. But when you do things through the Holy Spirit, as that song we just sang, Christ in me, Christ living his life in me, through me, you representing Jesus Christ in your home, you representing Jesus Christ wherever you go in your community, that people see Christ in you. I didn't know James was going to sing that song, but God knew. Yeah. And it's right along with what I'm preaching today. And that is that Paul went through a lot of suffering and went through a lot of pain because he was following Jesus Christ. And he says, as far as confidence in the flesh, I have all the, the reasons. And, and in uh, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 11, he says, you know, are they Hebrews? I'm a Hebrew. Are they Pharisee? I'm a Pharisee. And he says it right here. If anyone else thinks he has reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more circumcised on the eighth day. Of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law of Pharisee, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless but whatever gain I had I counted as loss for the sake of Christ indeed I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord Paul gave his testimony over and over and again why because it was the truth it was his life it was his life it was a testament to how he was living we call it the Old Testament, the New Testament, the Old Covenant, the New Covenant. And this was the reality under the Old Covenant, his life really stunk. He was actually attacking Jesus Christ, persecuting Jesus Christ, doing everything he could. And then he meets Jesus Christ and everything changes. And he says, all of that stuff in my past, I, I count it as loss. And I suffer the loss of all things and count them as rubbish. I think the old King James, it could be a different version, but I think it's the old King James says, I count it as dung. And I remember hearing some preacher, some famous preacher preaching a message on dung. What is dung? You know, it's like, think of all of the stinking excrement, not, not uh, you know, cow manure, not some of the stuff that actually works as fertilizer and good, no, Dung is the stuff that'll kill you. Dung is the stuff that will 
will cause you to get infections and diseases. Dung is the stuff that you don't want. And a lot of people have gotten sick because they put dung and used dung as fertilizer and it brought serious diseases. So he says to me, it's like human excrement or worse, it's like pig excrement. My righteousness, what I've done is rubbish, it's dung in order that I might gain Christ and be found in Him. What's your testimony today? Are you thinking you're a Christian because you like Christian things on Facebook? Because you come to church once a month or so? Do you think that's what it's all about? I mean, you could come to church every service and still be fleshly. I'm not saying that it's just, but where's your heart for God? You know, maybe you're going to another church somewhere. Maybe you're getting into the Word. But where's our testimony? What is our life saying? Is it Christ in me? Am I living a life for the glory of God? Or is my life all about me? And focuses on me. So as we're reading through 2 Corinthians, you, you just see a lot of this stuff coming, coming out. And you see that it's a, a spiritual battle. And some of you wonder, and, and, and you do go through a lot of spiritual warfare, and all of us do. You know, I do. Anytime that you follow Christ, the enemy's going to attack you. Right? Uh, he, he wants to to take our zeal away. And a lot of times he'll bring things, uh, really bad things into our life, and we'll say, well, man, I don't want that to ever happen again. And sadly, sometimes we pull back from our commitment to Christ because we don't want to have to face and confront the enemy. But I'm telling you, there's victory in Jesus Christ. Yesterday, the family, well, the, before then, way earlier they had asked me to preach on Ephesians chapter 6 10 through 18 at Adela's uh, funeral service and I'm thinking that's kind of a strange passage for a funeral service and yet as the more I studied it the more I realized that that's really the testimony of every one of us man we're in a battle we're in a battle with the devil and the devil's trying to destroy us and are we going to stand for Christ are we going to, you know, right from the very beginning, Adela uh, was called out because she became a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. And there were people in her family that attacked her severely and persecuted her in an incredible way. And even as a young uh, Christian, just young, a youngster, a youth, she gave her heart to Jesus Christ and came to know Jesus Christ and she stood strong and had a testimony in Mexicali and the Valley of Mexicali of being a follower of Jesus Christ. And it cost her, it cost her dearly to be a follower, but she followed. And then there's all kinds of other things that go on in life. You know, she, she then came over and she was a dentist in, in Mexicali and then had to go through learning the language, going to school, and became a dentist here in the United States. And then what did she do? Went on mission trip after mission trip, going down, using her skills to try to touch people. And she really didn't see a lot of patience because she was just preaching Jesus Christ to them, right? You know, just trying to share Jesus with them and say, hey, there's, there's a difference. There's an answer in Jesus Christ. You see, that's the way it is. When you meet Jesus Christ, then your life is not about you, but it's about Him. And that's what He's saying. This is my testimony. He said, I, want this. I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. For the sake of Christ, then, I am content with weaknesses, insults, Notice what he's content. Are you content when somebody insults you? How many of you are good about that? Somebody insults you? 
praise the Lord, or, oh, man, I'll get them. They're not going to get away with that. For the sake of Christ, I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, calamities. How many of you love it when you got calamity going on, calamities in your life? Man, we don't like that. But notice he says, I'll take all of this, of the enemy attacking me and persecuting me, I'll take all of that because I know that when I'm weak, then I'm strong. When there's less of Paul and there's more of Jesus Christ, that's when I'm strong. And so I want less of me and I want more of him. John the Baptist said that. He must increase, but I must decrease. Are we working on that? Is that the goal of our life? He must increase, but I must decrease. Or have we lost our way? Who are you reaching for Christ? Who are you sharing Jesus with? Who is your life? Are you shining the love of Christ? Are you making a difference in that way? And, and don't forget, there's a spiritual warfare in chapter 11. The, the last two, two days we, we read this. 13, for such men are false apostles, deceitful workmen, disguising themselves as apostles of Christ. And no wonder, for even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. So it is no surprise if his servants also disguise themselves as servants of righteousness. Their end will correspond to their deeds. So what do we preach? Do we preach Jesus Christ and Him crucified? Do we preach His resurrection? His resurrection power that gives us the strength to walk with God, to live a holy life? Are we seeking to be holy? Are we seeking to mortify the sins, the deeds of the body? Are we trying to have more of Christ in our life? You know, that's why God has left you here. That's why you're here. That's why you haven't gone straight to glory. The Lord loves you. He cares about you. And, and he, he loves you a lot. And before it actually talks about the, uh, the, the thorn in the flesh, this is why he said he had to have the thorn. In chapter 12, verse 1, I must go on boasting. Though there's nothing to be gained by it, and he's just saying that I'm an apostle, just like all these other people that say they're super apostles, I'm an apostle. I've been called by Jesus Christ on the road to Damascus. He called me. He saved me. And he put me into the ministry. I'm just doing because I've met him and my life has changed. And it's to him to be the glory. But a lot of super apostles, you know, they, Paul said, my ministry is a little bit different. They want big offerings. They want all kinds of money. I've worked. I've worked so that, that nobody would even have to pay me. And yes, some churches supported me, but also there were times that I would work and I would do that so that I could make the gospel free of charge. He says, these super apostles, they want all this money and it's money, money, money. But me, it's like I'll work, I'll do whatever I have to because I want you to know that we're not in it for the money. We're in it for the glory of Jesus Christ. We love you and we care about you. And, and that's what he's saying here. So he knows that he shouldn't be boasting. But why does he say that? He says, I will go on to visions and revelations of the Lord. He says, God has revealed himself to me. God has spoken to me. God has revealed to me the gospel. I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago was caught up to the third heaven. The third heaven is the, the real heaven. It's called paradise. Jesus said to the thief on the cross, Today you will be with me in paradise. He says, I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago was caught up to the third heaven. Many people believe that that was when that he was stoned with stones and left for dead. And the church gathered around him. And as they were gathered around him, probably praying for him, some may say, oh, he's dead. 
all hope's gone, but he stood up and he's raised from the dead. He says, I don't know whether it's in the body or out of the body. I do not know. God knows. And I know that this man was caught up into paradise. Whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. And he heard things that cannot be told, which man may not utter. On behalf of this man, I will boast. But on my own behalf, I will not boast except of my weaknesses. So he says, I've had incredible visions and revelations. So we've been reading along in the book of Acts. We go from uh, the letters to the Corinthians or the letter will be in Ephesians. But, uh, and we have the story. But I want you to see that how uh, that God came to Paul and spoke to him and ministered to him. And I want you to know that God will speak to you. Most of the time, God's Holy Spirit uses the word. But there's, if there's something in your heart that you're going through, there are times that God will speak, whether in an audible voice, an inaudible voice, but somehow God will speak to you and let you know how much he loves you, how much he cares to encourage you. And he, and he does it time and, and time again. So in Acts chapter 16 and verse 6, it says, And they went through the region of Phrygia and Galatia. So you have Paul and Timothy and, uh, you know, Silas. And so uh, Timothy is joining them, this great missionary team, Paul, Silas, and Timothy. And they went through the region of Phrygia, and I'm hustling to get to the close right here, okay? They went through the regions of Phrygia and Galatia, having been forbidden by the Holy Spirit to speak the word in Asia. So somehow there's some communication going on, right? The Holy Spirit told them no, forbid them. Somehow they knew God's Spirit said, no, you can't speak the word in Asia. And when they had come up to Mysia, they attempted to go into Bithynia, but the Spirit of Jesus did not allow them. The Spirit of Jesus spoke to them and said, no. So passing by Mysia, they went down to Troas. And a vision appeared to Paul in the night. He said, I've had visions. I've had revelations. A vision appeared to Paul in the night. A man of Macedonia was standing there. He knew who it was. He knew it was a person from Macedonia. He knew it was a person from, uh, from what was Greece at the time. He knew it was Europe. Instead of Asia, that God was directing him to go and to minister. And so instead of Ephesus and some of the, 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 the cities that he had ministered to before, there was another place God wanted him to go. And so he ends up going. And he says, he's standing there urging him and saying, come over to Macedonia and help us. And when Paul had seen the vision, immediately, we sought to go on into Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. So they're trying to do the will of God. They go one direction, God says no. They go, God says no. Another, God says no. And then in the night, and I tell you, a lot of times at 3 o'clock in the morning, God can reveal himself to you in a very powerful way. I used to get upset about it like, how can I get back to bed as quick as I can? But now I just kind of like, Lord, what do you want to say to me? What, what do you want me to know? What do I need to be doing? What, what are you trying to say to me? And, you know, God knows how to speak. He knows how to reveal to us. He knows and he takes his word and his Holy Spirit and together he works in our life and reveals to us the things that we need to know. You know, there was a time that God came to me and he said, hey, I want you to go to Latin America. I want you to reach Spanish-speaking people with the gospel. At that time, I was pastoring a church up in the mountains of Tennessee, perfecting my good old Tennessee accent. <laughs> yeah, see, I was born in Georgia, 
So I had to get it perfected, you know, and change it over and get some good Tennessee accent going. So he moved me up into the mountains. So my little daughter, when she came, she had a mountain accent, man. <laughs> but, you know, she was two years old, and she lost that accent. People laughed at her. <laughs> and there it went. No more Tennessee accent. She learned Californian really quickly. <laughs> but Dad, Mom, no, we just got laughed at and laughed at and laughed at. But God said, you're going to have a ministry. And that's why we came to Holtville. <laughs> Because they said this was a place close and there were a lot of people that spoke Spanish here. And you guys know the, the story. We do more things in Spanish in the Spanish language than we do in English. Not because we don't love English speaking people, but there's more Spanish speaking people and more ministry opportunities in Spanish here. And so we're working all the time. And what do I, I'm able to preach with passion, with power, as I preach in English, I can also do that in Spanish, and sometimes even more passion. Because God revealed to me that that was what I was supposed to do. He spoke to me, and he let me know. And I have no doubts that he spoke to me, and I've seen him fulfill his word. I'm saying, you know, God will encourage you. So when they go, what happens? Immediately Lydia gets saved. And this is where maybe uh, Paul might have got a little bit in the flesh here. In 1618, notice it says, This she kept doing. This was this demon-possessed lady, a spirit of divination. And she was doing this for many days, Paul having become greatly annoyed. It doesn't say filled with the Holy Spirit, directed by the Holy Spirit. He says he was greatly annoyed turned and said to the Spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. You know, he got in some serious problems. He got thrown into jail. He got beaten. I'm not saying that God didn't use that, but you know, it's, it seems to me it was like he was greatly annoyed. Have you ever gotten greatly annoyed and then said something, did something you wished you hadn't done? Yeah. Yeah. I command you. And then he realized, who am I? In the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And it came out that very hour. But it caused him a lot of problems. But you know what happens. Then the, uh, the Philippian jailer. And so maybe I'm wrong. Maybe he, maybe he didn't get in the flesh at, at all. Maybe this was God's plan. But i am noticed that oftentimes when I mess up big time, that God can, he's got my back, you know, and he can continue to use me and I just have to confess my sin and forsake it. But, you know, here they are. And what does he say? Does he say, oh man, you, uh, you appeared to me in a vision at night and you were wrong. And I'm not, I shouldn't even be here. Look at here. This is, I'm, I'm in jail because I'm following you. This is just not right. I mean, call my lawyer, call this, call that. Somebody get me out of this place. No, that's not what he did. He just worshiped Jesus, praised the Lord. He's praying. The power of God is on him. At midnight, he's singing. He was filled with Jesus Christ. So, you know, if, if I was right and he did get in the flesh, he immediately confessed it and he forsook it and he's right back into his... Aren't you glad that you don't have to... Uh, you don't have to grovel and, and, and just whip yourself to death that you can ask God to forgive you and you can be used because he goes immediately, he's put in prison and he's right back in the Holy Spirit and he's ministering in a powerful way and a Philippian jailer and his family comes to Christ. Amen. And then in, in Acts chapter 18... And it says that uh, the Spirit came and spoke to him in a vision. And uh, it's uh, in Acts chapter 18. And it says this. It says, And the Lord said to Paul one night in a vision. This is verse 9, Acts 18, 9. And the Lord said to Paul one night in a vision. And Paul said, I'll glory in somebody that I've had visions and I've had revelations. And so I needed 
to, to be humble. And so the more that you see God, the more that you have of God in your life, the more you'll have to be humble. But notice how the Lord came and says, Do not be afraid, but go on speaking, and do not be silent. For I am with you, and no one will attack you to harm you, for I have many in this city who are my people. Praise God. He had been beaten, put in prison. He had been stoned. Uh, you know, his list, five times I've been beaten by the Jews, 39 lashes. And he's going again, and it's the same thing. There's opposition of the Jews. And he's saying, what am I doing? What am I getting myself into? And, I mean, if I would have been him after all that he had gone through, I'd be thinking, man, is, is this really what it's all about? And God's Holy Spirit, or God came and spoke to him and says, listen, I am with you, and you don't have to be afraid. Just trust me. Amen? Praise God that God knows how to speak and comfort his people. What am I saying? I'm crying out to his church. Let's learn to serve, serve God, follow God. Let's not become so centered on this earth and what's going on that we forget the big thing, and that's to be a servant of Jesus Christ, a follower of Christ, and to live for him and to glorify him. Amen. Father, we thank you for your word. I pray that you'd help us to receive your word, help us to live your word, and just minister to us and through us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand as we sing our closing hymn. What number? It's up here. All, all to Jesus I surrender. Amen. If you need prayer.